a, t a quorum being present, this town meeting. Is Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will now read the warrant. To any of the constables of the town of Reading, greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby required to notify and warn all the inhabitants of the town of Reading qualified to vote in town elections and town affairs to meet at the Reading Memorial High School Performing Arts Center, 62 Oakland Road, in said Reading on Monday, February 23, 2015, at 7 30 o'clock in the evening, at which time and place the following articles are to be acted upon and determined exclusively by the town meeting members in accordance with the provisions of the Reading Home Rule Charter. Mr. Arena moves that we uh, dispense with a further reading. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. By the virtue of this warrant, I, on January 29, 2015, notified and warned all inhabitants of the town of Reading qualified to vote in town elections and town affairs to meet at the place and the time as specified by the posting attested copies of the town meeting warrant in the following public places within the town of Reading. Warren Killam School, Reading Police Station, Reading Municipal Light Department, Joshua Eaton School, Walter Parker Middle School, Burroughs School, Birch Meadow School, Wood End School, and Town Hall. The date of the posting being not less than 14 days prior for February 23rd, 2015, the date set of the town meeting in this warrant. I also caused a posting of this warrant to be published on the town of Reading website on January 29th, 2015. Thank you. One quick remark. Uh, in an article a little later in the warrant, I believe we have several people, several non-town meeting members that wish to speak. Just to reiterate the rule is that they have the right to speak after all town meeting members have first had the, the uh, opportunity to do so. Before we begin, Mr. Ryan has asked for a couple of minutes for a point of personal privilege. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Reverend Fricks, uh, Thomas J. Ryan, Precinct 1. I rise on the point of personal privilege regarding a matter of a procedure. I refer town meeting members to page 22 of the warrant. That's listed on handout guides. Several sentences state that materials and handouts must have the approval of the town clerk's office. In my opinion, the town clerk has no right to decide or demand what the contents of the material should be and when and where they should be handed out. In my opinion, these guidelines infringe on my First Amendment rights to the freedom of speech. Recently, I contacted the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, to get an opinion as to whether the town clerk or the office has the right to demand what the contents of a handout at town meeting should contain. The reply of the attorney was, unless there is a specific clause in the town's funding charter or bylaws that allow this, and according to Mr. Brown, there is no such thing. This is not lawful, arguably. This talk falls under the freedom of speech, pure and simple. A party is free to hand out flyers or should be provided. This does not fall under any freedom of speech exception. So generally speaking, no. This demand can be argued to be unlawful. I suggest that a page such as 22 be eliminated from future warrants. Thank you. Business under Article 1, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. I have a brief report on Article 1. There was an instructional motion made by Mr. Daddario at a prior town meeting, one of those monthly ones we had, I can't remember which, um, asking if the library director and myself would sit down and discuss adding more hours with the current staffing 
until they went into a new building. Um, the library director is quite clear that they do not have the resources to do that. They cannot off open on Thursday mornings to the public with cu current staffing. However, the library director and the trustees have agreed to do a, a full staffing study. Um, they will request funds at the April town meeting, the annual town meeting. They hope to have the results, let's say, by next November. And it's possible they'll have some mid-year staffing in anticipation of moving into a new building. And in any event, in the next fiscal 17 budget process, you will see extensive master planning on their staffing for their new space. Thank you. Ms. West moves that we lay the uh, uh, Article 1 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Business under Article 2. Ms. West moves that we lay Article 2 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. Business under Article 3. Uh, Mr. Lalasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a highly technical and complex issue that comes down to a really basic question. We borrowed money for the library, the first $10 million, a few weeks back. Since it's excluded debt, the DOR doesn't trust anyone. Everyone's going to break the rules when it's excluded from Prop 2 and a half. So in order to keep the premium that was paid, almost another million dollars, at the 1.5% interest, we have to ask your permission to reduce the size of the project. It's not going to really reduce the size of the project. It's just a technicality. If you vote yes on this, we will be able to keep the extra, I guess it's about $800,000 at this low rate of interest. If you do not vote yes, we will need to borrow that in the future at some unknown interest rate. It's not more complicated than that. Income report, Ms. Herrick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, FinCom thought it would be a great idea to borrow at this really great low rate, and we approved this article, um, 800. Is there further discussion? None appearing. We will try a hand count. If it is not unanimous, we'll take a uh, standing count as it requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 4, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, last annual town meeting in, in April of 2014, the town meeting voted to accept 600 odd thousand of Chapter 90 road repair money. Um, the legislator had approved a higher number, but the past and former governor did not release it. The new governor on the first day of taking office released additional funding and will need it for the potholes. Um, so if, if you will, approving this article will allow us to spend the 908,000 that the new governor and the legislature had already approved. Income report, Mr. McNeese. The Finance Committee voted 8-0-0 at our meeting on January 21st in favor of the article. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? Again, this requires a two-thirds vote. We'll take a hand count first. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 5, Mr. Lolasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'll handle the first small issue, and then Dr. Doherty will handle the bigger one. Um, just, just as a reminder, Article 5 puts things in the capital plan. Article 6 votes to spend money. The Finance Committee, for their purposes, and, and I agree for town meeting, thought it would be beneficial to have the full discussion under Article 5 for everything. We've done that in the past. Um, again, I'll hit the first one. We're looking to do 40,000 uh, improvements for Morton Field. That's the baseball field in the back of the high school. Uh, the selectmen had a discussion at a past meeting um, about the different improvements. Um, you can see the two main things here are, uh, no, it didn't actually say. It's in the, it's in the right up. Uh, handicap seating and safer dugouts. Uh, we expect all of this to be privately funded. However, the private funding was not fully in place. So they asked the best way to do it, whether they could start with half and then do half later. We said the best way is to have town meeting authorize the full amount, put it in the capital plan by June 30th, you know, have all the private donations put in. And my last update was the uh, donations raised were approaching 25,000. So this is 40,000 into the capital plan that would have been spent in a future allocation uh, to be paid all by private funds. 
and I'll say that this is another example of uh, the sports leagues in town uh, really stepping up to the plate. We really appreciate when they do things like this. Um, and the next item, uh, Dr. Doherty will discuss. I'm not Dr. Doherty. <laughs> uh, good evening, I'm Chris Caruso. I'm the chair of the Reading School Committee. So good evening, uh, fellow town meeting members. On behalf of the Reading School Committee, I thank you for the, your participation in this evening's meeting, asking you to come to a, yet another special town meeting in the middle of this never-ending winter was not a decision that we took lightly. We understand the inconvenience and the expense of convening our town meeting members, and we thank you for your participation tonight. This evening, we are presenting a plan to address space issues that exist at our elementary schools. These space issues have been caused by three main factors. First, our full day kindergarten program has continued to grow since, in, since its inception in 2005. Second, programmatic changes, especially in the area of special education, have led to an increased use of space within our schools. And third, we are experiencing an enrollment bubble that is putting pressure at the elementary grades. It's important to note that our enrollment numbers, except for this recent bubble, have not dramatically fluctuated since building the Wood End School 10 years ago. What has changed is the way in which we're using the space. When Wood End was built, we did not realize the importance of full day kindergarten. And we were also just beginning to make progress in keeping our out of district children in our schools. So, some might say that we, the school committee, have created this situation, and they're correct. We have built an outstanding full day kindergarten program with increasing numbers of families taking advantage of. Was I a believer in the need and value for full day kindergarten when I joined the committee 10 years ago? Honestly, 10 years ago, I was on the fence. Am I a believer today? 100% yes. What's changed? I've listened to educational professionals speak about its value. I've listened to our young families asking for it and willing to pay for it. I've witnessed a global society where our students need every advantage to help with their success. We've also done a great job in building our special education program. We have out of district students staying and returning to Reading, saving thousands of dollars in out of district tuition. Ask any family member, any family in a situation where there is a need for individualized learning and the overwhelming majority would prefer their children stay in Reading. But with these successes has come increased pressure on our physical plants. As was the case 10 years ago, we are running out of space in our elementary schools. The school committee has been discussing this situation for two years. We formed an early childhood education center working group to look at possible solutions. This led to both the Woburn Street School study and the proposal for a new building along Oakland Road. Neither option ultimately proved to be the right fit for our community. There are good reasons why these options didn't work. The traffic study at Woburn Street caused significant concern. The proposed location at the high school was also met with concern. We also heard very clearly that our parents would prefer their neighborhood schools over a central kindergarten building. Finally, the cost of a new building, roughly $30 million, was not something our town meeting members were ready to approve. So we've gone back to the drawing board, looking for the right long-term solution. The committee has reformed the Space Needs Working Group and continues to study alternate solutions. Tonight, we are presenting a near-term solution that we feel solves our current space issue. We see this as a near-term solution that will serve our community for five to 10 years. During this time, we will continue looking for the permanent answer. The solution we propose places two modular classrooms at Killam, Joshua Eaton, and Barrow. The estimated cost of the project is $1.2 million with an estimated annual operating, co operating cost of $20,000. We see multiple advantages with this option. First, 
the cost is significantly less than constructing a new building or renovating an existing structure like Woburn Street. Second, we have clearly heard a desire from families to keep their children in neighborhood schools. And finally, it gives our community time to find the right permanent solution. Dr. Doherty will present this evening on how we have arrived at the solution and the specifics around the project. After his presentation, both Dr. Doherty and myself will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Mr. Doherty. Mr. Moderator, request approximately 30 minutes for this presentation. We have a request for 30 minutes. Is there any objection? None appearing, Mr. Doherty. Thank you. Thank you, town meeting members. Uh, again, on behalf of the school committee, we appreciate you coming this evening to hear about this very important topic. Um, some of you uh, did come to our two informational sessions, so some of this may seem redundant. We have made a, a few minor changes to the, to the presentation. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about the current space needs. Um, the enrollment uh, situation that we are in, uh, the analysis of the classroom use needed for the next five years, um, the cost estimates for the modular proposals, and then uh, certainly we'll take questions at the end. Very quickly, want to go through the timeline and how we got to this place, and probably the most difficult uh, enrollment to predict each year is our kindergarten enrollment. Um, we do have each year um, the census information, uh, which isn't always uh, the most accurate predictor because you have families moving in, you have families moving, moving out, and that's done on an annual basis. And so the registrations were due to us last December 2014 for the 2015-16 school year, um, which is the normal time that we have done registrations. At that point, we, and we knew as the registrations were coming in that we were, again, having a very high number of families that uh, were requesting full-day kindergarten. Um, and so we anticipated this, and on the 22nd of December, we met with the school committee and laid out some different options that the school committee could consider uh, moving forward to address the short-term space needs that we were, we were dealing with for next year. Um, and I will go into more specifics in those numbers in a minute. The school committee voted at that time for us to take a look at a, the modular classroom option, which we then came back on January uh, 8th with the modular classroom option where we recommended six modular classrooms, as Mr. Caruso said, two at Barrows, two at Joshua Eaton, and two at Killam to address the space needs for the next five or plus years. Um, we then made these presentations to the Finance Committee. Um, we then uh, made a similar presentation at the Financial Forum where the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee both voted that evening. Uh, one, the Selectmen to put it as a special town meeting and two, for the Finance Committee to uh, vote on, on the article. Um, we then held informational sessions for town meeting members uh, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, uh, which several of you attended. And so we are now at tonight's town meeting. Um, so th this is the timeline where we reached this point. Um, again, as I said to you in January when, when I, I gave a, a brief report, uh, we could not have waited until April town meeting to give this presentation because we do need the large turnaround time if the, if the module is our approved to have them ready for the opening of school. So the elementary space needs are being driven by the following, and, and Mr. Caruso mentioned some of these. First of all, we are experiencing two population bubbles at Barros and Killam for the 2015-16 school year. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some numbers of that in a minute. We also need to add a grade one classroom at Joshua Eaton for next year. Uh, currently, our class sizes at Joshua Eaton for kindergarten are at 24 and 25. We know that there are five, at least five, uh, students that are currently in private kindergarten that will be coming back to the Reading Public Schools next year that will make those class sizes go even higher. So um, we are gonna need to add a teacher. That teacher is in the FY16 budget and it has been reallocated from existing funds. It's not an additional position. So we are gonna need an additional classroom for 
um, to move from three kindergartens to four first grade. Uh, we have seen over time, and again, I'll show you some numbers in a minute, an increase in enrollment in full-day kindergarten over the last several years. And that's really being driven um, by an increased need and an increased understanding of the value of full-day kindergarten, um, not just in Reading, but in Massachusetts and across the country. What we have seen um, over the last 10 years has not necessarily been a change in enrollment, but we have seen a change in program. Education is different now than it was 10 years ago, and, and this is one of the, the changes that we have seen. The other change that we have seen is an increase in in-district special education programs. Um, this, is, this is a way to keep our students that are on, uh, in specialized programs in our district with their peers in inclusionary settings. It's, it's the right thing to do for those students. There is certainly also a financial benefit to it, too. It is much uh, less, uh, less costly uh, to educate students in district than it would be to send them out of district um, and pay for transportation and a private placement. Um, we also are dealing with some space issues at Barrows on top of the population bubble. One of the classrooms that we have been using uh, for the last um, few years is a smaller size classroom, which was originally supposed to be a music classroom. Uh, we've been using that as a uh, kindergarten classroom for half day, the most that can hold are 12 students. Um, we've also seen a steady increase in enrollment at Joshua Eaton over the last, since 2010-11 school year. What we are finding is in the Barrows Eaton uh, districts that there have been a large turnover of homes um, where younger families are moving into those areas, which has caused this increase in population that we're seeing. And then also we have seen a decrease in the number of art music classrooms that we've had um, at Barrows, Hillam, and Joshua Eaton. So you can see here, this is the full day kindergarten enrollment from uh, since 2005 when we started uh, the full day kindergarten program. And you can see that over time, what has happened uh, is that the percent of students that uh, are attending full day kindergarten has increased. Um, the full day kindergarten enrollment has increased every year. I, I do want to add that the numbers that are in the warrant um, are as of December 19th. These are as of today. Um, since December 19th, we have added 10 additional students. So one of the important things to remember throughout this entire discussion is that we're talking about kindergarten enrollment of 306 students right now, and that we have a long way to go before the start of the school year. And we will traditionally add another 20 to 30 students with families moving in Families that may not have been aware um, of the registration period that we have had in place over the, over, over the last several months for kindergarten. So the 306 is currently right now what we have from enrollment. Um, that, that very well will change uh, between now and September, the start of school. Here are the registration numbers um, as of today. A um, couple of places that I do want to point out to the uh, first at Barrows, you can see here that we have currently have 85 students that are uh, slated to go to the Barrows District next year. We normally have somewhere between 60 to 65 students that are uh, in a grade at Barrows, sometimes a little bit less. Um, you can see the original census number is 92, so um, that, that is fairly consistent with the census number. Um, the, the other area is uh, Killam. We have 76 students at Killam. Uh, currently right now, but you also see that there are 99 students in the census, so there is potentially more students in the Killam District that have not registered yet for kindergarten. Um, so those really are the, the two population bubbles that I was referring to earlier. When you look at the kindergarten and space need projections um, over the next one to five years, um, Normally, what we see, and there, there are different ways to break this down, because what we have tried to do, and I'll, I'll show this in a slide a little bit later, what we've tried to do over the last couple of years to maximize and, and make as efficient as possible the space that we've had available is that we have uh, looked at different ways to um, take our half-day and full-day students and integrate them into the same classroom. So in some cases, which we have done, when we have a high full-day number, and a low half-day number, we have integrated those students in the same classroom, meaning that they, um, the half-day students will go until 11.30, um, and then 
when the full-day students go to lunch, the half-day students go home, and then the full-day students remain for the rest of the day. This allows us to maximize the classroom space that we have available to us. So in some cases, that, that has worked and we've been able to use it. But in other cases, we do have to use a, another additional classroom for the half-day program because the numbers are too big. Um, so right now, what we're currently looking at for next year is that we will need um, four classrooms at Barrows, um, three at Birch Meadow, three which would be an integrated classroom at this point, and that may change with Joshua Eaton, um, three at Killam, and uh, three at, uh, two, I'm sorry, two at Wood End. We then projected out what this would look like over the next five years, and so what we assumed, we did make a couple of assumptions in this, because in five years, the students that we're talking about aren't even born yet, or moved into town. So, so the assumption that we made is we're using historically what normally would be the, the number of classes that we would have in a grade. So we use 2014-15 as the baseline year. Um, you can see that every school but uh, Barrows is at a neutral number. We have Barrows at a minus one due to the fact that we are currently using a much smaller classroom as a kindergarten classroom, or a classroom that that can't be used for numbers greater than 12. Um, and you can see over time that we slowly but surely will get to the number of classrooms that we will need, the additional classrooms that we would need for the, by 2019-20 school year. Um, and so that's where the number six came from. We also currently have classes that are on stage um, at both Joshua Eaton and at Killam, which are factored into these uh, numbers. Mr. Caruso talked about some of the programmatic changes that have occurred um, since we went to five elementary schools. And I think it's important to see those in numbers and how it breaks down at each, at each school. So in 2005-06, when, when the fifth elementary school came online, um, we had one full day kindergarten classroom at each of the five elementary schools. Um, we had one special education classroom space program that was not learning center because um, all of our schools had learning centers in the past. And uh, that special education program was at Barrows. It was the DLC program. Um, and we also had dedicated art and music classrooms at each of our uh, elementary schools. You can see now moving forward to 2014-15, we, we now have 12 uh, classrooms that are dedicated to full-day kindergarten, with two of those schools having integrated classrooms. We are now up to seven classrooms in the district that are using classrooms for special education programs. Um, again, those are students that normally in the past would have been sent out of district um, at, a, at a much larger financial cost to the operating budget. And also, um, w it really is the right thing to do for our students. And then you can see that our art music classrooms have decreased over, over that same period. We've also tried to do as much as possible, reconfigure the space that is available. And so these are just some examples. Um, so you can see uh, at Joshua Eaton, uh, we, we've taken, in a lot of cases, and you'll see this at Joshua Eaton and Killam especially, we've taken what was originally non-classroom space, uh, whether it be storage rooms or, or teacher work rooms, and, and we've converted them to educational spaces um, for students. So we have maximized every single uh, nook and cranny at, at these, these schools um, so that we can maximize the amount of full-size classroom space that is available. So you can see, for example, the Joshua Eaton, we, the stage is currently being used as a music classroom, um, office space that's being used for small group instruction for our Title I program, our occupational therapy and physical therapy services. Um, the um, art room is a converted work room. It, it really isn't a full-size space. And we do have at Josh Wheaton two learning, lab, uh, learning lear, language learning disabled classrooms um, which share a space. Killam has probably been the most creative with their spaces and you can see that a lot of uh, smaller spaces have been converted at Killam. Um, and even we're using it at times the teacher's dining room uh, for, for morning meetings with uh, the SSP children, the SSP program. And then it, Barrows, as I mentioned earlier, where we, we reconfigured um, the music room, which originally was a music room, and then it was reconfigured to a special education classroom, and then um, 
this uh, last two years has been used for a kindergarten classroom. So there's some other issues that are related to the space needs um, that we've, we've brought up this evening. One is the community impact. And I think as Mr. Caruso said earlier, families with young children are moving to ready for the quality of our schools. And they did their research and they, and they knew that full day kindergarten was available to them. I do, wanna, I do wanna mention too is that full day kindergarten in Reading is a tuition based program and will remain a tuition based program for the foreseeable future. Um, so these are families that have made the commitment um, to providing the full day kindergarten through a tuition based program. Um, the, the other important point which I, which I will make clear a little bit later too, because um, it will have an impact operationally, is that without the additional space, we will have to do a lottery. Um, and potentially 40 to 80 students um, will not have access to full day kindergarten next year. Um, without the additional space, students that will be assigned full day, and it'll cause a space issue in 2016-17, when they become first graders. This will be most notable at Barrows. You saw before that we had um, you know, 85 students or 83 students that are assigned to the Barrows District for next year. Um, you could probably put those into half day classes for 2015-16, but 2016-17, those students do need to go into full size classrooms. So the class sizes will have to split into four classrooms. If we don't have this classroom space, the class sizes are gonna go up significantly um, at Barrows. The same thing is gonna happen at Joshua Eaton for 2015-16 if we don't get an additional classroom space at Joshua Eaton. Um, the, other, the other factor that may occur is that some families may choose, and, and families have, have, have done this in past years, is that they may choose to either hold their child out for a year in, in kindergarten and, and have them come to kindergarten the following year, or they will send them to private kindergarten. And then they come back to the Reading Public Schools in grade one. Normally, we've seen about a 10% bump up between kindergarten and grade one. Um, my, my fear is, is that if we don't have this additional space available to us, that bump up will be significantly higher, which is gonna be, cause significant space problems in the 2016-17 school year. So the, the proposal that is put forward to town meeting tonight is to place six modular classrooms at the elementary schools, two at Killam, two at Barrows and two at Joshua Eaton. And as Mr. Caruso said, this should address um, our space needs for the next five to 10 years as the uh, space needs working group works on a much more permanent um, solution. There are some other measures that we have used to address space, which I have talked a little bit about before. One is the integrated kindergarten program. Another is something that we've called the superintendent's option. Um, which, which really, we've moved small numbers of students, usually um, five or so in a, or less, um, for students moving in to Reading or kindergarten students that do not have siblings. Um, and they may be assigned outside of their home district within two miles. Once we go outside the two miles, we would need to provide bus transportation. Um, and we've done this in the past, more so to balance class sizes across our five elementary schools, which we've been very successful in um, over the last several years. Um, the other thing that we have done is we've tried to, so that we could use the same classroom for art and music. Um, we've scheduled art and music classes on opposite days or opposite times to maximize space. Um, the downside to this is that it does not allow for any grade level common planning time, which really is critical to maintain that consistency across the same uh, grade. So a question that may come up is why not redistrict schools? I mean, it was done in 2005-06 when the fifth elementary school came on board. Um, redistricting usually occurs in a school district when one of two factors happens. You either open a new school or you close a school, um, or you see a dramatic increase in student population in an area due to new developments. Um, we've not seen either in this area. I mean, we've seen some turnover of homes, um, in, in the Barris and Eaton District, but we've seen similar population bubbles at Birch Meadow and at Killam in past years. So this is something that does happen in, in cycles around, around the community. Um, we've, 
We've ha also um, been reassigning kindergarten and new students outside of the neighborhood schools for the last four years. Again, it's been in small numbers, and I'll show you a slide that, that really says, you know, we really can't do that in larger numbers. When you go through a thorough redistricting process, and some of you may have been through it in 2005, 6 um, it's not something that you, do, you take lightly. It, it's a year-long process that goes through numerous conversations and public meetings and trying to come up with the best solution um, that creates the least amount of disruption. And it's something that you don't do every couple of years. Um, you do it, and usually you want to do it, and it's going to last for a long time. Um, the situation that we're dealing with right now is because of some population bubbles that have happened in two schools, um, at, at Killam and at Barrows. Another question that may come up is why not use the superintendent's option in a larger scale? Um, that certainly is, is something to look at. There are some, there are some reasons why we can't do that. Um, one is, is that the amount of students that we would, be we would need to be able to move um, are not geographically in the right locations. Uh, and you would not have space in some of the schools to be able to do this. So for example, in order to um, move students out of Barrows, you would have to move them to Birch Meadow. You really couldn't move them to Joshua Eaton because Joshua Eaton already has a space issue um, for next year. So in order to move them, you would need to move at least 20 students to Birch Meadow. But you can't move 20 students to Birch Meadow because Birch Meadow's class sizes would be then higher than, than Barrows's because they also would require space needs then. Um, you would need to move at least 20 students from Killam to the Wood End District. Um, you need to move 10 students from Joshua Eaton, but unfortunately we don't have a place that we can move those students to because we have space crunches in, in the other buildings. Um, you can't just move student, uh, any student. You need to move students that don't have siblings. So that complicates um, the situation because you don't want to have families with, with children in two different elementary schools. So there, there's a lot of logistical issues that go um, with that. And then the other issue is, it, it, five years from now, and we, we've experienced this problem in the past, is that Birch Meadow, Wood End, and Killam feed into Coolidge. Um, piece of Killam and Joshua Eaton and Barrows feed into Parker. So at the end of five, six years, when these students are ready to go to middle school, um, you wouldn't be able to move the students that where you relocated from Barrows to Birch Meadow to Coolidge because then you would have class size issues at Coolidge. So then you would need to move them back to Parker, which then creates a whole nother set of issues um, because these students have been away from, they're gonna, they're gonna, you're removing them away from their peers who they've been with for five years. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why you really can't be shuffling the students around um, the district in large scale numbers. So taking quickly a, a look at the, the classroom modulars, and I do want to emphasize that the current locations that we are showing are not etched in stone. We have not gone through a thorough architectural design process yet. Um, these are based on preliminary um, drawings. One of the fact, many of the factors that are involved with the placement of modular classrooms is the location of utilities, um, the site prep development. You want to make sure that also that um, we conform to all the, the town zoning bylaws um, uh, that are associated with this. Um, so at, at the Barrows Elementary School, currently um, the, the location that seems to make the most sense is on the blacktop area behind, directly behind the school. Um, we did look at another area at, uh, off to where the basketball courts were, but um, for, because of distance from the school and, and proximity to the, the neighborhood area, um, it doesn't seem to be as feasible uh, a location. But again, this is, these are preliminary. Um, at the Joshua Eaton School, um, there is a grassy area behind what I believe is the library area. Um, this, this area would seem to be most suitable for the modular classrooms that would go um, at Joshua Eaton. By the way, the one, the green, the green square that you see equals two modular classrooms. And then at the Killam, um, Although it would seem that Killam would have plenty of, of space uh, to, to house uh, modular classrooms, the, the area that seems to make the most sense right now is off to the, the back corner near the playground area. Um, 
the, the field area is going to be redeveloped over the next couple of years, so that not, would not be a suitable location to put the modular classrooms. Um, I certainly will be going out to, to bid on this if these are approved uh, this evening. And um, the pricing would include the site prep work, the footing, the foundation systems, the installation costs. Um, we are going to put into the, the bid, if we need to uh, in the future, any dismantling or removal costs, um, the option of the cost to own, and then the option to take a look at refurbished units, although it is our intent to look at um, new modular classrooms for these areas. You can see here is a uh, estimated cost option, uh, the cost for, for, for the purchasing of, of these. Um, you can see that this includes the site prep and utility tie-in, uh, which may be a little bit different in each building depending on the location of uh, the, uh, the utilities. Ideally, we would like to connect these to natural gas and not electricity to save on utility costs over time. Um, there is going to be some architectural services, uh, some furniture, fixtures, and equipment is built in. And we have put in a, a slight contingency of 5%. The site prep work, in, uh, most of this is minimal because uh, it is in, in, on flat areas. So there will not be a lot of clearing of land at this point that we anticipate. Um, so the, the estimated cost for this purchase is uh, where we get the $1.2 million. So um, the impact of this on the operating budget, uh, I'm sorry, the estimated uh, full day kindergarten impact, the current class size of the grade one through five population is going to require the reduction of the number of students who can participate in full day kindergarten, as I mentioned earlier. Based on the current registrations, what we anticipate is approximately 40 to 80 students um, would not have access to full-day kindergarten if we do not have the modular options. Um, we also will see a reduction in our extended day program tuitions um, because several of our kindergarten students do access our extended day programs before and after school. So what we are estimating is that um, there will be an impact to the operating budget for FY16, somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000 because um, we do take an offset to our operating budget for both full day kindergarten and extended day. In addition to that, we will also be reducing somewhere between one to two teachers because you're going to see a decline of full day kindergarten enrollment, so you don't need as many staff, and also a decline in the number of, of paraeducators which go with those classrooms. The operational expense, um, we do not anticipate at this time any additional personnel costs. Um, these are existing staff in the district that we would be moving around for next year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have two classrooms that are on the stage right now, so, so that would be part of this shift as, as well. Um, the additional grade one teacher at Eaton that we would need um, has already been the school committee approved budget for FY16. Uh, we took restructured personnel. Uh, these were paraeducators that were already in those um, over si overpopulated classrooms, and so we're we're going to reconstitute those positions to fund the additional grade one teacher. So there is not at this time any anticipated additional personnel costs, unless of course in the future we have unanticipated enrollment increase, which at this time we can't predict. Um, the operational costs for utilities are going to range somewhere between fifteen to twenty-five thousand per year. That is going to depend on whether we're able to use natural gas or electricity for uh, heat um, at the, the modules. For those of you that remember the modular classrooms um, that, have, that were at Birch Meadow and Barros and Killam over the years, um, they, the ones of these days are much different. Um, when you go into those modular classrooms, and North Andover is a, is a school district that uses modular classrooms extensively for their early childhood program. Um, when you walk into those classrooms, you don't realize that you're in a modular classroom. And from the exterior, it also the same. Um, so the modular classrooms of today are, are much different than the ones that I think all of us are thinking of when we had the portables many years ago. And there's certainly a community benefit uh, to, to the, uh, the purchasing of these classrooms. It allows to main compar maintain comparable class sizes at Eaton, Barrows, and Killam. 
Um, we, we try to keep our classroom sizes in K to two uh, from 18 to 22 students. Uh, research shows that this is, a, this is the, the optimal number that we want those class sizes to be, and we've done everything we can over the years to keep those classes at that, those sizes. Um, it will provide space for families to have access to tuition-based full-day kindergarten, um, which is something that attracts young families to Reading. Uh, it maintains the quality of our kindergarten program. We're very proud of our preschool and kindergarten programs here in Reading, um, and this will help maintain that high quality. It provides a five to 10 year solution while the working group works on a longer term solution. And the other thing it does is because th these modular classrooms are equipped with air conditioning and uh, bathrooms, um, is it does provide summer learning classroom space for our summer programs, um, which, which I think is an important point. Um, you know, right now, our programs are not in air conditioned spaces, and these will have spaces that are also available to the community to use, um, uh, to rent a classroom, uh, for, for, for meetings and things like that. So it, there, are, there are definitely community benefits to um, having these modular classrooms in the, in the community. So um, again, just to summarize the modular classrooms that we're, that we're needing, um, are two at Barrows, Eaton, and Killam. The estimated cost is 1.2 million, and the operating, annual operating cost would be somewhere between 15 to 25,000 a year. In car report, Ms. Perry. Hi, we met on January 21st and having the same presentation from Dr. Doherty and having a thorough discussion of questions and answers. We voted 8-0-0 to approve this. We feel it's the most financially prudent decision at this time and you know, a very reasonable approach to the issue at hand. Further discussion, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, a question to the town manager, if I could, please. I, I know I put you on the hot seat, Bob. Uh, could you explain for some of the people in the back of the hall and perhaps some people here, what free cash is and if we use 1.2 million for this, what will the impact be on the operating budget next year or f future years? Mr. Lesher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, free cash is unfortunately named free cash, not really free. Um, it's like the town savings account. Different people that have savings account have different philosophies on how to use it. Some people use it only for extreme emergencies. Others use it to live off of from time to time. So there's different approaches to it. Um, for many years, I've argued with the Finance Committee that money doesn't grow on trees, but last year I finally conceded the point that in Reading apparently it does, because as soon as they use it to balance the budget, even more comes in. But assuming that at some point gravity reasserts itself and this does not continue to happen, if you spend a million two this year on free cash and we don't mysteriously come into more money, that's less money available for future operating budgets. The, um, the budget that town meeting will see in April has a million seven right now of free cash used. Um, I'll just speak personally. The first million I think is easy and very comfortable to use. As you get above a million, it's a little uncomfortable. Um, but at the same time, uh, the bank account the town has um, is quite robust because it keeps falling out of the sky and growing on trees. Finance Committee has a policy that suggests roughly $4 million should be in this bank account. We have over $8 million. So the cash is available, but to Mr. Brown's point, if you use a million two for this, the million two will possibly not be available either for next year or the following year or, or the third year to fund what are the operating budgets of both the schools and the town. Thank, thank you, Bob. Um, on a, your excuse. <laughs> I, I thought that was, a, I thought you had a uh, drawer on your uh, desk, Bob, for free cash. Um, on a little of a moral issue on this, what we're providing is full day kindergarten for those that cannot afford it. Uh, how about those that cannot afford it? And uh, bring your attention to the Massachusetts Constitution that says all children shall be educated equally. So the child that can't afford it is gonna be left behind in this program. Uh, if you truly wanna make it, let's make everybody uh, go to school. Let's raise our taxes. 
We can all move out because there won't be any money left. Bye-bye. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? John O'Neill, Precinct 4. I support commendation and a regret. The support, I wholeheartedly support the uh, proposal. I think it's, uh, you know, it was innovative. I know my, my youngest was at, you know, when it's in a portable classroom at Barrows and certainly didn't suffer as a result of it, and that worked out fine. Uh, I also am a strong believer in neighborhood schools, and I'm, and I'm Accommodation is, is to the school department for listening to parents. You know, my kids are far, far past that, you know, but I think that's it, important that they listen. They also listen to town meeting. I think town meeting expressed concern about the cost of the early intervention center, not, the, not that it wouldn't be a good idea, and I know I was concerned that we would lose any support for what is a valuable, you know, resource and component of, edu of our educational system. So it's accommodation to the school department once again for, for listening to that. My regret is that it does continue the policy of what I consider, you know, semi-public schools. I mean, we have all sorts of fees, <laughs> high fees, and now we're asking pe people pay tuition. I would hope that it won't take five to ten years before we can be even more creative and come up with some additional locations or whatever so that we can have full day kindergarten for all students that is really a public full day kindergarten. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Caruso? Uh, thank you very much for the, both those comments, Mr. Brown and Mr. O'Neill. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to make two simple statements, which is we still offer our half-day kindergarten program, which is free, tuition-free. Uh, we also have tuition assistance for any family that can't afford the full-day kindergarten but chose to use it. I hope that's helpful. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Ensminger. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dan Ensminger, speaking as a town meeting member, Precinct 7. Uh, for you, to Dr. Doherty, uh, I have a question on SBA reimbursement policies vis-a-vis -vis modular classrooms. I believe it was in the 1990s when renovations were done, at least the Birch Meadow, and I think also one other school, it slips my memory which one, they had modular classrooms there. And one of the conditions for getting SBA reimbursement was that those had to be taken down. Now, I, I've heard that the situation has changed, but the question is, what assurances do we have, either in the form of policy that's stated by SBA or personal communications in writing that this will not happen again should these schools need permanent uh, renovations in the future? Dr. Doherty? Thanks, that's a, that's a great question. Um, since since that um, the 90s when that happened, S SBA has actually moved to a different branch of, of government. So I, I believe the, the rules and regulations have changed regarding um, space and how it's funded um, since since those days. We we don't have anything in writing right now. We have not pursued that um, I, at that you know at the point that if we are going to be going to a more permanent solution at that point, then we would certainly be looking into that. Um, but at this point, we've not, because we're not looking into that type of permanent solution. But um, to speak to what happened in the 90s, to the best of my knowledge, we, we do not have anything in writing that would indicate that we can't put modulars now on, on site. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Barry Berman, Precinct Four. Um, thanks for that great presentation, Dr. Doherty. Um, I think there's one thing you you may have glossed over a little bit in the, in the presentation, and that is just sort of the um, the population bubble that has been occurring mostly in the Killam 
and Barrow's area. I think it's something that um, is something that we could sort of almost semi-predicted in the sense that Reading has really become um, a product of our own success. Young families are desiring to move into town um, because of the high quality of the education. You know, the cat is out of the bag. The numbers are out. People are looking at Reading as a great value, not only just for the schools, but to, to live in it as a town. Um, they want their kids to be able to compete with the kids from Lexington and Winchester, and we're doing that, and not just in hockey and football. We're doing it in MCAS. We're doing it in a lot of other ways, and so the word is out. So the fact, it, so it's not surprising to me that some of the post-war houses around the Barrows area or the Killam area are, as um, older folks sort of um, downsize, are now being populated by families with young children or with um, newlyweds who are going to have children. So the idea that the population uh, in this area is growing shouldn't be surprising and it shouldn't necessarily be viewed as an anomaly. Um, I think it's something that as we do our job and as, as a town we begin to grow um, and have success, people from the outside are going to know about that. So I think it's really important that we realize that while we're addressing the school space needs now in 2015, 2016, that it's something that um, we should really be um, looking at as something that's going to grow. Not necessarily by new developments, obviously the Pulte development did not increase the um, uh, number of school-aged children, but it's just as those houses turn over, um, they're being populated by younger families and that's just going to increase needs down the road. Um, there was a slide that Dr. Darty you had up there that I think is just incredibly telling. And it's the one that talked about sort of the, the snapshot of how we used our classroom space in 2005-06, which is by the way, when my son went to Barrows at the first class of all day kindergarten, um, when that school was brand new, um, to where we are now. And I don't know if it's possible for you to bring that slide back up. Um, I think the crux of the whole discussion is really in this slide. In 2005, 2006, which was the first year, um, you know, it's just when the new schools were coming online, um, we had, um, we had basically um, one special ed class dedicated to, um, in, the, in the five schools, we now have seven. We did have 10 art and music rooms and we're down to seven. So even if the population did not increase one child, we're down nine classrooms vis-a-vis -vis what we were in 2005 and 2006 when the voters voted to, to, do a new, uh, to do Wood End and to have Barrows. My son had a full day, he had full day kindergarten, he also had a art, dedicated art room and a dedicated music room. And, and because of the popularity of all day kindergarten, those things have been whittled down. And so um, just adding these six new classrooms, I would imagine would give the flexibility um, that we could recover those art and music rooms in the schools as well as you know, sort of predict, you know, sort of have some flexibility if we do have increased enrollment. Um, I think when we were here last time discussing this issue, what was on the table was a $25, $30 million new building. Um, and, you know, that did not work out and, and probably for the right reasons. Now what we're being asked to spend, um, and that was going to be, what, 15, 16, 17 classrooms, I think, when we were discussing that. 17 classrooms. We're now talking about six classrooms um, for a million dollars. I just think from a financial point of view, um, it's almost a no-brainer in that we're going to be able to at least temporarily um, fix our, um, our needs for space without having to go back to the voters again to do another override, to do another uh, debt exclusion, to build a new building to, for kids to go to, to not to their neighborhood school. So I think it really, you know, this, this to me um, makes total sense um, to do. And I think as we look forward, as we go forward and think about sort of, you know, what, what is it that we're going to need in space that, um, uh, that at least we now have the time to do that. So I encourage um, town meeting members to vote for this. Um, it allows uh, those folks who want the all-day kindergarten, who are willing to pay for it, um, to have that without having to leave their district. Because even if we don't 
even if town meeting you decide not to vote for this, and those folks who leave the district because they want all day kindergarten, they go to Woburn or Wakefield and go to a private setting, they're going to come back here for grade one. So all we're going to be doing is being back here next year talking about the same problem. So here's a chance to get this done. I'm glad it's not costing 25 or 30 million dollars like it was last time. It's costing one with, with some operational money. So I encourage town meeting members to support the one article. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Tuttle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dave Tuttle of Precinct 3. The, first off, I'm, I'm in favor of this. I think it's smart money. I think it's the right amount of money and for the right benefit. Um, I'm wondering if you have had the opportunity to look into the Chapter 40 S uh, provision since we do have the between Oak Tree and Reading Wood a fair amount of uh, Chapter 40 R smart growth and we might be able to find some more money in the sky if we look appropriately. I'm also curious about the we have the operation plan performance guarantee for the maintenance and upkeep of the current schools and I'm wondering how this ties in with with those uh, plans which are currently in process and um, I want to be thoroughly in favor of this but also I hope we realize that this is the beginning of the next stage of planning because as they say the the pig is in the snake and it's going to be moving through the other classes as they go. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Ms. Docker? Dr. Ms. Docker, excuse me. Uh, Nancy Docker, Precinct 1. Um, less than a year ago, I asked Dr. Doherty at his Coolidge presentation prior to April Town Meeting what the classroom shortage would be if full day kindergarten was eliminated, and he said there would be no shortage. I asked him that same question two weeks ago at Killam, and he said he didn't have the numbers. So I'm having a hard time differentiating between what is a classroom need and what does a classroom want. Now, I see this as a really referendum again on full day kindergarten. I have been rather open in that I'm not a fan of full day kindergarten, and that's really about child development theory. I understand a lot of things have changed. We need to remember that we're discussing yes, yes, finances I mean, tonight. Yes, exactly. Well, the reason why is because things have changed, but child development is such that the rate of human development, children's cognitive development, actually hasn't changed. It's actually remained rather constant. And I think Piaget, the French uh, child psychologist, you know, used to say he really didn't like lecturing to American audiences because they were always in such a hurry to have their children grow up. Now, it's not just developmental theory. There are plenty of educators who actually question full-day kindergarten. Again, I remind you, yes. we're, we're talking about the spending finances. money for... Yeah. Spending the money. Because the concern is educational studies have shown that this isn't necessarily a good investment for our town in terms of money. Not when educational needs tend to decrease after first grade and they tend to dis dissipate after third. And it's not just the educational studies, it's the cost analyses of full day kindergarten. You know, Dr. Doherty's own studies, whether it's the Washington State study or the Pell or the Georgetown or the RAND studies, actually all say the same thing, that there is a very small subgroup that actually does benefit from full day kindergarten, and that's children who either are minority or come from impoverished homes. So the issue that other speakers have raised is what's the ethics of actually charging tuition um, when what, you're only gonna give this to families that actually can afford it? You know, I have a lot of concerns about this being tuition based, we're being asked to actually buy module classrooms out of what we call reserve credit and have programs in them that are actually tuition based. When in fact, we can't guarantee that that's a secure funding source. 
there have been successful lawsuits in three different states challenging full day kindergarten tuition base and that's not even talking about the lawsuits in illinois or, no, or nevada uh, the school department has told fincom that without tuition they would be short annually i think the number was eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars that's a, a large revenue coming out of our free cash on an annual basis you know my concern is that we have a limited amount of municipal dollars which translates into a limited amount of school dollars. The concern is not that this isn't popular. You can look at the surveys. You know, you can see the audience. You know, many of us have gotten, you know, letters, uh, a variation of the same letter from a lot of people. I have no doubt this is popular. I'm just not convinced that we should be making financial decisions based on a survey. If that was the case, honestly, my children would have had the pony. The concern I have is that I think that we need to look at how we best want to use our money. You know, I would like the town manager, you know, next to address not the five or 10 year projection, but I think the 20 year economical picture that uh, they tell us they're going to be presenting in May and looking at what the population is going to be looking like. Not just our elderly population, but our school age population over time. I don't think that voting against this is going to give our written school system a black eye at all. I, like a lot of people, moved here for location and for the schools, and I don't believe that this is going to tarnish our reputation whatsoever. Um, one of the things I really enjoy every year, actually, is hearing Dr. Doherty stand before us and brag about the students, the schools, the teachers. I think we have a lot to be proud of. I'm just really not sure that this is actually the best use of our municipal dollars. I'm gonna borrow something that Jean Borunsky said, Borowski said, just because she stated it so eloquently. She said we have, you know, mandated, educa mandated education, we have needs in education, and we have wants. I think that this is a want, and I'm actually going to vote against this. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Downing? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jack Downing from Precinct 7. I have um, six points, but I think I want to start out saying that I'm a believer in kindergarten and especially in pre-kindergarten, for the, especially for those that need it. I think children benefit best when they have both pre-kindergarten for socialization and then the first round of kindergarten for real educational experience. But um, this problem that we have, this space problem, it's entirely created by this need or perceived need to provide full day kindergarten. The real need is this. State regulation requires that we provide for free half day kindergarten, 425 hours per year, and that um, in reality, we also have to provide full day kindergarten for those students in the kindergarten screening that are identified as needing that in their individual education plan. That amounts to about 50 to 75 students, not 250 or 300 that need full day kindergarten. The state says the need is fit about, and I don't know what the numbers were from, from last year or what they would, will be for this year, but the numbers are about 50 to 75 students. And um, the rest of the children can do equally well with half-day kindergarten. And um, um, more importantly for children, ch child education, I think it would be important for us to talk to our state senators and our state representatives and mandate the need for parents to have their children go to kindergarten. Right now, parents can keep their kids home. They can show up when the kid is seven years old, say, I want my kid in school. We have no choice but to put him into the first grade with no preschool, no kindergarten. And if we don't do that, they'll be 19 when they enter their senior year in high school and they, they'll miss out on a lot of things. So um, I think that's something that everybody should be looking to do. And if they really care about education and really care about kindergarten, they should, it should be a state requirement that parents have to send their kids to kindergarten at age five or at age six if they're not ready. Um, Reading is not a type of a town that has a great need for um, 
full day kindergarten there are towns in the immediate area in adjacent towns and my wife teaches in a school where more than fifty percent of the students are are have reduced lunch programs because it is really an impoverished area of of that town that she that she works in those kind of districts they really need full day kindergarten those specific districts within those towns need it because they have a lot of kids that come they have ELL issues and some of these kids are very bright but they don't speak a word of English except please and thank you um, Reading's not like that Reading's not in that category um, uh, according to the Center for Public Education the best performance you can get for early childhood education is to have a pre-k program in a half day kindergarten not a full day kindergarten if you give them pre-k and half day it will be about a three percent improvement but if you give them that combination there's about an 18 percent improvement over the typical half day so what I'm saying is pre pre-kindergarten is just as important as kindergarten um, the other issue is that over my my about 10 terms as town meeting um, I've seen town meeting um, I've seen this body add portables to different schools, watch their rapid deterioration, um, and then rebuild those portables into permanent additions onto, almost to, onto all of our schools or to build a new school. And I don't want to repeat those same problems of building temporary space and all the problems that come with that temporary space, which we observed over those, those periods of time. I would really rather see a small amount of money put aside to plan something more permanent for all five schools so that we have space for preschool and full day kindergarten for all children. Finally, in, in summary, I'm concerned about the long term economics of, of purchasing something that's clearly temporary in nature. I'm also very concerned about the security issues. No sooner do we put these portables up there and they're outside, they're basically outbuildings behind this fortress that has video to look at who's coming at the door and buzzers and things like that. And what do they have? They got a flimsy little portable door on a school. It, it's a very vulnerable issue. Me, excuse me, uh, do you want me to comment on each one or do you want me to wait? No, I'm not asking for a comment. Okay. I'm coming to a conclusion. I'm also concerned about the heating and maintenance costs of these facilities. Electricity costs are soaring. I can't see adding natural gas to each of these these units, it just doesn't make sense. I'm concerned about the maintenance, and frankly, modular trailers don't make any sense. All of the problems that we've discussed here today can all be resolved by eliminating full day kindergarten for everybody. I think in the long term, I'd like to see it, but this is not the appropriate approach. We need a permanent solution. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, I'll come back to you. Mr. McNeil, please. Thank you, uh, Paul McNeese, Precinct 2, speaking as a town meeting member, not a member of the Finance Committee. Just wanted to respond to two of the points that just came up. I mean, the first one right now, the fact that all of the modular classroom space that you just mentioned that was on previous schools has since been, I guess, made permanent or new schools built, to me, doesn't that show that that was the right idea? We didn't jump into something. We tested, we spent a reasonable amount of money, we went with a modular to understand that yes, we're not jumping right to the $20 million option. We're gonna go, we're gonna spend a reasonable amount of money, we're gonna give something that the town is strongly asking for, and we're gonna do it in a financially responsible way. So I actually see that as a very strong reason to do this. Uh, I think, you know, I commend the work that the school committee has done to reach out and find a reasonable solution to this problem. Uh, the comment that was made before uh, about potential pending threatened lawsuits is exactly that. They are in locations that are not similar to ours. I would hate to see Reading start to act and start to make decisions about potential threatened lawsuits in other areas. Um, I'm not sure who would bring those lawsuits. We have an overwhelming group that is willing to pay for this. They are the ones who want to pay for it, so I'm not sure who would even start um, such a, you know, a, a potential lawsuit. Um, you know, again, 
I don't think it needs to be said. I'm strongly in support of this. I think it's a great idea. I think we have found the right way to do it. I also echo the comments that this is a starting point. This is the most reasonable approach to take a small bite at it, solve the most immediate problem, and then continue the work that the, uh, that the school space needs group has worked on. So I would urge everyone to you know, vote in favor of this and, and continue the work that has been started. Thank you. Mr. Caruso. So I would ask that you remember that this is a legislative body and, and please do not make any demonstrations. Mr. Caruso. Thank you, my comment will be brief. I want to assure everyone at town meeting and in Reading that the portables we are proposing will be secure. We will be working with police and fire. Did I say portable? I should have said modular. So I'll say portable, I don't care. Um, <laughs> these will be tied into all of the same security features that are in our main buildings. These will not be some latch that you can go in and out of. They will follow all of the same procedures that our main buildings do. Uh, of all of the things that were said, I, I guess I took exception to that one the most. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. I have been a town meeting member for quite a while. I've lived in, in this town for 40 some years. Uh, we can see from the presentations how we've evolved to this point. Uh, $30 million school, a lot of reasons why we couldn't go in there that we've looked at seriously. And now we're down to a point where something has to be done. Kids are learning on a stage in a workroom. Uh, and uh, I'm aware, <laughs> being a senior citizen, the pressure's on people that are seniors and they have to look at the budget. Uh, I, I support early education. Studies have found that people do better, the country will do better with early education. Now, I have my own feelings and vote and the people that are, that are concerned about budget could have contacted me. I'm a town meeting member, I have a vote. I have my own opinions. But I'll tell you, people organized for this. I've got dozens of letters here promoting this project. And I think it's cost-wise a good idea. We get nine, 10 years to look at other ways of doing things. Maybe we'll win the lottery, but who knows? <laughs> But any, anyways, I'm in support of this, and I thank the people that took the time to contact me. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. O'Rourke? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom O'Rourke, uh, Precinct 2. Uh, I guess a similar comment as the gentleman just mentioned. I think I, too, have gotten a number of letters uh, in the last few days, and uh, it seems to me that uh, many parents uh, are at a point where they have children who are immediately going to be impacted and they have made that decision that this is important to them. I think the uh, statistics that Dr. Doherty showed, it's, a, it's something that has increased over the last 10 years and I think we have an obligation as we did when our children were of that age to uh, support something that uh, parents, so I think at the uh, end of the day, the parents really hopefully know what's best for their children and for their education. So. I, I endorse it, I support it, and uh, I think uh, it's important for the town. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. D'Addario. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ron D'Addario, Precinct 6. Uh, my daughter's in Brooklyn. She ha has half day kindergarten has to make arrangements to have the children picked up, taken someplace else. My take is that young families have an awful lot of stress on themselves. Uh, some of them leaves college with a huge amount of debt, and uh, now they're starting a family in Reading. And my, my take is that we should not put any additional stress on, on these young families, and that we should provide all day kindergarten for everybody who wants it. Uh, in addition, it would be my hope uh, that in the future, it was mentioned briefly by Mr. Brown and Mr. O'Neill and several others, that down the road we could provide, you know, free education from at least kindergarten on. 
So it, I, I would ask people to vote for this, and let's make it just a little bit easier on, on our uh, new parents. Thank you so much. Further discussion? Mr. Welk? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Weld, Precinct 7. Um, three quick questions. Is there currently a lottery in place? Mr. No. Caruso? There's no? Not. There's not currently a lottery in place, no. The last time the lottery was in place was 2016. Close. 2007, 2008 was the last time we had a lottery for full day kindergarten. Who, don't, don't quote me on that. Who uh, made the policy change to do away with the there lottery? There wasn't ever a policy in place for the lottery, it was something that happened over time when we were, when the demand for full day kindergarten um, got past what we could allocate for space, the lottery went into place, and then we tried our best to accommodate as many families as we could since then. But there is no formal policy. Does that okay. help? I don't know if yeah, I'm I was that. just curious because when my two oldest went through kindergarten, there was a lottery. When my youngest went, there wasn't. It would seem to me that that would need to be a policy that the school committee would make. So I'm wondering who actually made the decision to do away with the lottery. It's a good question. We, the school committee never um, voted to have a lottery, nor voted to take away the lottery. The lottery was something we did to try to accommodate as many families as we could that were looking for full day kindergarten. OK, uh, one point to follow up on sure. those questions. Given the fact that for roughly the past seven or eight years, we have had space issues at our schools. And having a lottery in place, um, it seemed extremely um, imprudent to do away with it, knowing that we were already taking away art rooms and music rooms, and we had special needs compliance issues that are state mandated because of taking over classroom space for full day kindergarten. It seems to me that that was not the smartest policy decision, given our space limitations. I, I now we're in this situation, it's water over, under the bridge now, over the dam, whatever expression you want to use. I'm not thrilled about this. I think this is the least bad option in front of us. So in the end, I'm probably going to end up supporting it. But I think my personal sense is this body gets its back pushed up against the wall a lot by decisions that get made. I don't always think that a lot of foresight is given and that stuff comes up and we're asked to vote on it immediately or the sky's going to fall. I don't like that. Um, I know others don't like that being put in that situation that it's on 192 of us to make a decision that with some better foresight and planning wouldn't be as catastrophic if we don't agree with it. Um, like I said, in the end, I'm probably going to end up supporting this because it's the least bad option facing us right now. Um, I hope that moving forward, we can look past the next two or three budget cycles and really take a hard look at where this town is going to be 20 years from now. Um, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Struble, Precinct 7. I have a question to try and figure this out in my own mind of the, I guess, the school committee and school administration. I'll direct it at Mr. Caruso, and you can relay it to Dr. Doherty if you can't take it. <laughs> um, as I understand it, a couple town meetings ago, we had a um, very, I guess, uh, involved explanation that the policy of the school committee is to pursue um, an early learning program and dedicate yourself to that to the point where you tried to get a $26 million building built and it didn't go past this body. Um, I'm assuming that, that program is still to be pursued. Am I correct? Yes, absolutely. Then the question I have is where do these portables fall in the pursuit of that program? Is this a stopgap measure? 
Is this a way, a, a, a procedure for the moment to take care of the bubble that's going on now, or is it part of a grand strategy that you will be, you're developing at the moment? Mr. Caruso. I see this as a near-term solution, not a permanent solution. I see this, um, uh, I see this as a five to 10 year solution to the problem. It will allow our families that want full day kindergarten to have access to it. It will take care of the other space needs that Dr. Doherty spoke of. I don't think it's the right permanent solution. Obviously, it wouldn't be called. So it, di it didn't necessarily come out of the working group. It, um, uh, you know what? I could ask Mrs. Borowski or Mr. Robinson to speak to that, but I don't believe that this came out of the working group, no. Okay. The working group really is looking for that permanent solution, whether it's a new building, whether it's an addition to existing structures, whatever it is. But we can certainly agree that that's going to be more than the okay, million but, dollar. But this one, the, the monies expended now are not to be regarded as part of that solution. I is wouldn't, no, I don't think so at all. I, I don't, I don't think that modular classrooms, the six that we're proposing, will be part of our permanent solution. I don't think they can be. <laughs> From the past experience and sure. to answer Mr. Uh, Hensminger, it won't fly. But, but I, might, I might speak just for a moment, and, and I agree with what you said. But uh, again, parent of Birch Meadow kids, the portables were up when my kids were there. Um, wow, see. <laughs> and uh, I, I think we would say that they were at the end of their life at that point. But that was after 25 years. 25 years. So when we talked about, when we heard earlier about dilapidated portable classrooms, wow. Did we get our money's worth out of those things? So uh, the, the modular classrooms that we've been looking at, quite frankly, are excellent educational spaces. I think when I say five to 10 years, I'm being very uh, modest. Well, that's why I asked the question, is this part of a grand strategy? Because yes, they do last longer, but right. they don't last as long as the SBA wants them to last. Agreed. That's 50 years. Agreed. And there's no, there is no SBA funding for this, just right. to be clear. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right on the aisle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Jackie Petrillo, Precinct 6. I just wanted, I, I have a six and a half year old who's a kindergartner at Birch Meadow. I have two four year olds who will be kindergartners um, in a year and a half. I, I just want to clarify, everybody keeps talking about parents who want full day kindergarten. It's not a want for most of us, it's a necessity. We, I come from a two parent working household Without full day kindergarten, uh, we wouldn't be a two parent working household. We wouldn't be able to afford to live in Reading. Um, it, it's not that I love paying for full day kindergarten, but I happily do it because I don't have an alternative. I, I not only pay for full day kindergarten, I pay for extended day because I don't have an alternative. So I, I just want you know this body to be aware that for most of us who send our kids to full day kindergarten, it's not a, a, a matter of whether the gains are long term or short term or whether there's you know preschool option not preschool it's a necessity we need to work we we want to live in a town like reading and in order to do that we need the money so we need to work so i just would you know encourage everybody to bear that in mind um, tonight when you're voting for this it may not be the best option it's clearly not the end end all option but it seems to be a, a reasonable option to get us to where we need to go. And certainly I'm in support of it and I would encourage everybody here to vote for it. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, people that have not yet spoken? Yes. The heck? Thank you, Mr. Moderator Bill Heck, Precinct 8. Um, as someone who had children and grandchildren in the modular classrooms at Birch Meadow, and someone who has a grandchild who's a special needs person and benefited immensely from the special education that was provided by this town, I urge us to go ahead and bite the bullet for a relatively inexpensive solution to a pressing problem. Uh, I marvel at the fact that Younger families have to have two working uh, people in order to afford to live in Reading. I was very fortunate uh, that wasn't the case a million years ago when I was young and I moved into this town. 
a million years before that, I actually had full day kindergarten provided free in the city of New York shortly after the Second World War. Uh, so it's not a new idea. I seem to have survived full day kindergarten reasonably well. <clears throat> and I manage most young people will. But I think the issue is a pressing need for young parents who essentially have to have some support from the town. I wish it wasn't that way, but then there are a lot of things I wish weren't that way. Okay, I wish I didn't have two grandsons in the Air Force defending our bacon. Uh, I wish I didn't have a child, two children in fact, who are veterans. Uh, they gave me a lot of gray hair, but I think this is a must decision for the town. If we want to enable young people to move into this town, Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Steve Herrick, Precinct 8. Uh, first, I wanted to say that I do support this. I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's smart money. Um, I also want to observe that had we approved the early learning center a year or so back, we'd still be having this conversation today because I don't think we can turn these things around in a year, I'm pretty sure. Um, there is one element to this that I'm a little bit uh, conflicted about. Uh, the free cash issue, I'm gonna go back to Mr. Brown's original question. Um, to me, this feels like a capital project, and I know we have, to, we have, a press, we have another question coming up here to move this to capital funds. Um, we're pulling this out of free cash. Um, there's been a lot of discussion amongst people who are close to the town's finances about sort of the, the coming issues that we have. Um, it's gonna get worse down the road. Um, is free cash the right way to do this? Can somebody walk me through the, the, the thought process that got us to this point where we're dipping into free cash to the tune of a million two, I guess, plus some ballpark or something, uh, where we're doing that because it seems to me that there are potentially some downsides to this, and I just think we need to, I, I hope everybody in the room understands what that means to us down the road. I don't know if Mr. Lasher is prepared to talk to that on um, sort of throwing it out at you, but I just, to me it seems like a, it feels like a, a little bit outside our normal operating procedure to fund this kind of project, and I'm just curious what your response to that is. Mr. Lasher? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, part of the solution is the time of year it comes up. If this were part of an annual budget discussion and not the mid-year budget discussion, it's possible we would have had a different look at it. Um, if we didn't have as much free cash as we do, and I hope it does keep falling out of the sky, we may not be able to have this as an option. Um, certainly the other option is to uh, borrow for it, to you know, use debt. There's no need. This were the fire chief asking for a fire truck for a million two. I think I'd have the same recommendation: use free cash. So it doesn't really matter what it is. It's just we're in a position to spend about that amount of money on one item that's necessary. Why incur an extra cost to borrow money for it? Now, if it were even two or three million dollars, I think I would have a different answer. But for a million dollars plus or minus, this is fine. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, yes. Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gary Phillips, Precinct 7. Um, I'll, I'd like to say right at the uh, onset, I am strongly opposed to this article. Um, first of all, uh, we're looking at something that's an optional program. And it, we're looking at a program that does not meet an educational need. It does not meet an educational need, and I say that on a basis of two considerations. Number one, it's not mandated by the state. Number two, uh, this alleged need could be met in a private sector. I think it is really misplaced, misdirected. I don't think it even belongs in the public education system. Uh, another uh, reason that causes me to oppose this uh, strongly is the fact this proposal is in fact nothing less than a springboard for another building project. And where that Mr. is the Phillips, case. Mr. Phillips, you're making an assumption here. Um, uh, 
I don't try to guess what, what the ulterior motives are. Well, Continue. Well, Mr. Moderator, we've, we've gone through building projects over the last several years where space has allegedly been the, the justification for this new high school. And in fact, we reduced capacity by 27 classrooms against the objections of others like myself. Space is an underlying justification for this program. And the modulus, I don't think there's anyone here who disagree with me when I say this is a springboard for another building project. And that's where it will lead because they won't accept permanent, permanent uh, modulus. Uh, we knew uh, years ago that modulars were spoken of as unacceptable for our students. And that was one of the prime justifications for uh, the expansion at Barrows and the Dividends Road School. <coughs> Moving on, uh, this is, uh, I, I stand by what I just said. And I think that in fact, because it is justification for a building project and that there will be an increased space need, and this is the reason for saying this, is uh, that this is the most ineffective uh, and costly way to approach what really will be the end result, the final outcome. <clears throat> Another fact I'd like to bring to our attention and consider as representatives of the town, as representatives of the town voters. Presently, we have approximately 63% residents in town who do not have school-aged children. Approximately 36% do have school-aged children. Out of the some uh, 296 kindergarten parents, uh, I believe it's only about 227 that would like all-day kindergarten. If we're to be representatives of all the taxpayers in our community, it's necessary that we go carefully in evaluating programs like this because we're spending the hard-earned tax, uh, the, the, the tax dollars of many people who are struggling and can't afford uh, barely to meet their necessary, their necessary expenses, which are more pressing than a proposal like this one before us. Um, moving on further. <coughs> I also question the uh, educational uh, benefit or need for all day kindergarten. Uh, at that age level, the saturation level, the focusing level for a full day program for kids at that age really uh, diminishes. Uh, and again, I think really it's partially a problem in mislabeling. I see it more as a daycare program and not kindergarten or educational. Uh, Another point <coughs> I'd like to share is, is one that I find ironic where this uh, proposal is concerned. Our primary responsibility in our school system is to provide quality education. And in the face of this proposal, our first area of, of uh, responsibility is actually deteriorating. Um, our effectiveness in education here at Reading has fallen since 1998. At that time, we ranked in the top 20 in the state. Today, we, we have, have a point of order. It certainly does. We're talking about quality of education and we're talking about how our tax dollars are spent. And I think that this issue I'm presenting relative to our poor performance, we've been reclassified. You do need to remember, we're discussing whether or not to buy these uh, classrooms. And uh, it's, it's, a fisc it's a financial matter that we're discussing tonight. You, well, yes, in the scope of how we yeah. spend our, our tax dollars, this is altogether of primary significance and relevance. So I'd like to continue. Um, after spending over $6 million since 98, uh, and um, we, we've just recently fallen from level two category 
to level three category. We're no longer to be Again, this is, you're getting off the subject. The, the point is well made. You're getting off the subject. We are discussing whether or not to purchase or to, uh, to rent new portable classrooms. So please stay on the issue. Well, okay, then, Mr. Moderator, I'll close by saying this. I think it's ironic that uh, this proposal, which isn't all about education, is something we're being asked to spend our tax dollars for. And in an area where uh, educational performance is concerned, uh, it's deemed to be not relevant. But anyways, I strongly uh, disagree with this article. I intend to vote against it, and I hope all of us will have the uh, tenderness of conscience to consider this carefully in light of uh, how hard-pressed some people are financially in the community. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, yes, over here. Hang on. No, I'm, on the far end, I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Hansen, Precinct 7, and Chairman of the CPDC. Uh, a question and a request. The question is, just to make sure I'm clear, this is one structure per school each with two classrooms? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and the request is, assuming this passes, uh, please solicit input from the teachers on where the structure should be placed. Um, there's a number of considerations that the teachers will have to manage. For example, if you look at Barrows, um, the kids are going to have to get snow boots on and jackets to get them into lunch, get them into the, the gym and things like that. Um, so again, as the chairman, I'm definitely going to want to hear about that input if you uh, come forward uh, to site plan review. Thank you. Okay, over here on the finance committee, I had a... Ann Landry, Precinct 5. Uh, I'd urge my fellow town meeting members to vote in favor of these Warren articles. Uh, it's a cost-effective solution to a very real space need in town, uh, that need being for adequate classroom space for special education programming, art and music education, reasonable classroom sizes, and equal access to full-day kindergarten for all families desirous of such programming. So it is true that full-day kindergarten has in part driven uh, these space needs, but the space needs themselves go to, go to more than, than simply full day kindergarten. Um, and there, there's no option on the table to take full day kindergarten programming away in its entirety. So the result of not passing this article would mean a, uh, a lottery system whereby not all families desirous of this programming uh, will, will receive uh, what they're looking for. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, Mr. Sasso? <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, first of all, I just want to um, state my support for this uh, warrant and proposal as well. Um, I'm not going to try to stand here and debate the values or merits of full day kindergarten or not, um, it's not my expertise. Um, but I know we do have a very supportive group of um, constituents that have, uh, as I think the previous speaker had said, uh, expressed their support. We certainly represent all of Reading and they do represent a significant portion. And I'd like to express their thanks again for conveying that to us. Um, I do still want to see, I know one of the things we talked about um, the last time, and this certainly feeds into this, um, the strategic plan, the where are we going, because the space needs that, that have been described here beyond full day kindergarten, the special, special education program, I've certainly seen firsthand at Killam how, how uh, they have, uh, as I think Mr. Doherty had said, uh, utilized every nook and cranny in that building. Um, so I certainly, um, uh, given the time, as a town meeting member, I'd, I would rather see some updates to that um, and not, some, not a rush to judgment to, to take your time and come up with something and engage us for in input and feedback and, and go through that process. And I, and I understand that that Space Needs Committee is working, but you know, I'm looking at, I'd like to see some, some real uh, obje good ideas outside of the box, so to speak. Um, uh, two, two quick questions, um, and uh, actually it was just mentioned, is um, were there any I'm, I'm, I'm certain, obviously, that um, teachers and principals were, were engaged in this. Were there any specific 
uh, issues or concerns that they raised that were not addressed in this particular approach or solution? And then uh, this, the second question is, um, you mentioned um, that there would be th these locations are not final. Um, there would be some um, potential moving. When, when is that going to happen or how is there a process that's set up for that? I'm just curious on those two, two things. Do you have an answer, Mr. Caruso? Uh, I'll let Dr. Doherty answer the first question regarding teachers' input, which I know we did get, um, but maybe Dr. Doherty can speak to that more. Um, when we determine the placement, your second question was around placement of the portables, uh, we do want to try to find the shortest path to utility, because that's ultimately going to make for the lowest operating expense. But we also want to make sure that the buildings are in a place that's best conducive to learning. Uh, that's kind of a no, uh, The question is more, when will that oh, I placement apologize. occur, and what is there going to be a uh, Depending on this evening's yeah. vote, those meetings will begin to be planned. Will they be, will they be public meetings? Absolutely. Or? Okay. And, and again, about okay. Sorry no, that's fine. I got tired there for a second. Well, the, f the first question was sure. related to um, teacher feedback or any concerns that may not have been addressed. Mr. Doherty. So, uh, thank you. When we went to um, the school committee on December 22nd, we put forward to them a few options. One was modulars. Another one was to take uh, some space at the Parker Middle School, their multipurpose room, to take a look at that and build two classrooms there. Another one was to actually take a look at Hillam's high D areas and put some classrooms there. Um, it was very evident from conversations that we had with staff and with the community that the modular classrooms would be the best way to go because of the locations at the elementary schools. Um, if I can piggyback on Mr. Caruso's point for the second question, um, we're gonna be working very closely with town officials uh, for the locations. Some, some of this may be out of our hands in terms of location um, because of wetlands or conservation or um, location of utilities, which would increase the cost if we moved it in another location. Um, so some of this may be out of our hands in terms of that. Um, just, just a quick reminder, not that you guys always remind us, but as a town entity, you're not subject to zoning. No, um, we, yeah, <laughs> we, no we know that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. See, there was a hand down here. Yes. Right here. Greg Savatelli, pre uh, Precinct 6. As a uh, parent of both a 12-year-old and a 5-year-old, I um, just want to say I'm in full support of this. As far as my 12-year-old goes, she was part of the lottery back in I don't know, 2006 or whenever it was, and we lost. It wasn't fun. We actually did take our child out into another private care, and it cost double or, or even more than that at that time to, to educate them in full day in the kindergarten. Which, if you look at today's families, most people are two working, two working parents or a single working uh, uh, person, and it puts a tax and a toll on those families. So it's not always an option for those parents to do a half day. They're still going to find other ways to provide for that education and that time. As speaking from someone that has a child going into next year's kindergarten class, I am in favor of having this modular classroom versus a community area where they would either have to bus them to or drive them to every day, which I'm glad this option exists. You can walk them to your schools, which is part of, you know, Reading's atmosphere. Walk your kids to school, bring them somewhere close. Um, even if my kid wasn't good, if, if, if I missed it by a year, I would still be in sort of support of it. We've had three, four new families moved into my neighborhood, and I know all of them are in support of this. All of them want their children to be at that school, in that location. Um, and speaking as someone that grew up in Reading, I remember when Barrows had that modular classroom. I can't remember if I was in that one or if I was in the main building because I just can't remember back then. <laughs> but <laughs> probably speaking more of my age than how good the program was. But I, I, I loved Reading. We moved back to Reading. Um, I think this is important. The way this Reading is evol e evolving is not just about you know, what the state mandates. It's what we mandate for our families, for the tax base that's coming into this town renewing that tax base. We're looking at improving the education, improving what people want. So yes, it's a small percentage of parents that are, have kids going in next year, but that percentage is always gonna be there year after year. And we need to look at solving the solution in the near term, and then looking at longer term solutions, whatever they might be. 
So I'm in support of this. I hope everyone else is in support of this, at least from the perspective of the working families of Reading and what they are asking for. I did not receive any notes from any town meeting members who were against this, only people in favor of this. Thank you. Further discussion from those who have not yet spoken? Not, uh, yes, right here. Um, hi, okay, Cynthia Cool, Precinct 6. Um, I'm going to support this. Oh, sorry. Hello? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Precinct 6, Cynthia Cool. Uh, I'm in support of this. Um, I originally was in support um, of the opponents, um, thinking that it wasn't a good idea because I had a child that I thought full day kindergarten would have been too long of a day for. And, but we always had support. I had you know people that could watch the child all the time. And I have to say that this is um, money, it's not a lot of money um, to support all these children that um, seem to want to have um, a place at least the parents want to have a place for them um, during the day. So um, I think it's a really good expenditure, and I'm going to um, definitely support them. Further discussion from people who have not yet spoken? Mr. Mandel? I just have a, a kind of a little walk down memory lane for us who were involved in the building of the fifth uh, elementary school at Wood End. Um, these were the enrollment projections that were worked up by Landsberg. And the, the main point is that there were multiple projections and these projections were the ones that the town went with to SBA. Done that. Um, so basically, the enrollment projections, and this came out with a lot of uh, dispute and discussion, and it turned out that these were the ones we went with, and at the time, the projections were to be that we were gonna have about 2,400 students in the elementary school. Uh, it turned out we never really approached that number. I think the highest number we ever approached was about 2,100, give or take, oh, 30 or, or 40. But be that as it may, this is what we used to the, to the uh, to, uh, SBA, and we got approval for the school. Um, and Dr. Doherty, if you can correct me if these are right or wrong, but these were the classrooms that we, we had in the fourth school solution was 97. With the fifth school, we had 104. And this was, of course, supposed to cure the uh, long-term needs of the system, um, always knowing that uh, the projection was at that time that we would have 10 total classrooms for kindergarten, but of course this was based on the half-day model, not the full-day model, that one through five, we would have 84 classrooms available, uh, art and music was a total of 10, and there were three for SPED, and there were two for TAP, which I'm assuming, is that computer, the computer ones? Yeah, it would be the, com the, the computer, and I'm not sure as to the space size on those SPEDs and the TAP. I don't know if they're smaller, like 600 square feet versus a large Okay, so, so in any event, the projection at that time, based on a of uh, 22 students per uh, K through second grade, 
and 24 students from uh, third, fourth, and fifth would allow a, a total enrollment capability of about 23, uh, 20, well, let's call it 2,400 students. And I think last summer I, I asked John if um, what our enrollment was, and I work about 2,000, so it's about 2,000. So my, my question, and I never really got an answer, was what happened to that excess capacity? Now, we heard a little bit tonight what happened to the excess capacity, um, and this is, this is just, uh, just some actual historical enrollments. An elementary school was 2,037. In 2000, the before school scenario, um, the capacity is about 2,400, or it was projected to be that. And uh, it's about uh, this year, it's about about 2,000 students. So again, um, I wondered where the space went. But we, as we heard tonight, um, instead of instead of instead of being four, we're using. They're small, okay. So, so that's why I, I guess we, we no longer have a capacity of, of 2,400 students. Okay. So, um, so this just gives a little bit of background, um, and uh, and they're all and again here are our enrollments, uh, about 30, 30, 333 in 2000, which was basically half day only. And now it's, it's um, yeah, it gets off the page. Let me just make sure. There we go. And about 323 now, which the majority of them are being full day. So that's that's the area that's the most affected. Okay. So that's 306. Yeah, you, we need okay, to speak so in the microphone. So it's, so it's 306 for that. So, um, you know, I guess the, the take home message is if we want to stay with half day, we probably have enough space, and if we want to go with a uh, full day for the, for the folks who want it, then we're going to need more space. And that's all I have to say. Further, further discussion of people who have not yet spoken? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Paul Sylvester, Precinct 3. Uh, one question that I have that doesn't seem to be in any of the information we have is, so how much is the all-day tuition? And if we, uh, if we add 80 additional students, and I think I've heard that we're not looking for additional staff, uh, what happens to the revenue from that? How much of that can be used uh, towards defraying the costs? And uh, how do we set that number? Is that number uh, competitive with uh, um, you know, commercial alternatives? And because uh, I'm hearing two things tonight. I'm hearing uh, education, but I'm also hearing what seems to amount to extended daycare for some of our children. And my concern is that in my precinct, in my neighborhood, there are a lot of, uh, of older residents and they're having trouble, you know, making the payments that they have right now. And so that, that's the same issue that our young parents have in trying to, you know, be two wage earners. So we have that same thing in the seniors and I, I just love to hear that addressed. Mr. Nardi. The, the tuition is $4,200. Um, it's been $4,200 for four years. Um, prior to that was $4,000. Um, the, the FY16 budget was based on an assumption that we would have the same number of students next year as we do this year. So when I'm talking about 40 to 80 students less, that will be an impact to the FY16 budget because those students are already when we took an offset to the budget for next year for full-day kindergarten tuition, it was assumed that number of students as we have this year because our numbers have continually increased. Um, 
So that, that's where that number came from. So adding those 80 students on an additional 80 students, it's to keep us with the same offset that we have now. Okay. Further discussion? Ms. Webb? Clarification that that money cannot be used for the modular. Thank you. Um, there were two other parts to your question. So the $4,200 is actually at the high end of tuition rates for kindergarten in Massachusetts. Um, it is based on a number of factors coming up with that, that number. Um, it's the cost of the teacher, the paraeducators, the materials, the supplies, a portion of the principal's time, the nurse's time. So all of those things are factored into that, that $4,200. The other thing that we, we did look into this piece is we cannot use tuition from a revolving account for capital projects. So we did look into that to see if we could provide some uh, relief. Further discussion? Yes. Please know the doctor. Hi, Linda Snow Doxer, Precinct One and also a school committee member. I'd like to first of all thank everyone for coming out in this weather um, to have this really important discussion. Um, I'd like to say I'm definitely in favor of um, funding the modulars. I'd also like to say that initially I wasn't because I moved into Reading 18 years ago and we had all of the portables at the different elementary schools. Um, I was so much a doubter that I drove out to North Andover to see what we were actually talking about. And what I found was apples and oranges. The portables that I saw in North Andover were beautiful. In fact, one of their buildings, their early childhood development center, is actually made entirely of modulars and they have a long-term plan to keep that building. Um, that is not our plan and I think that's been made clear. Our plan is that this is a stopgap until our Childhood um, Space Committee and potentially the town building committee that was voted on at the last town meeting can get together and make a long-term plan that will work and answer the needs of the town. As Dr. Doherty said, we don't really know exactly how many children will come, but if we build it, no, I don't want to say it that way. Um, <laughs> if we have high quality schools in our town, there are going to be young families that want to move here. And to me, that's really important. I think that um, 18 years ago, that's why we came to Reading. We and many of our neighbors from a neighboring town moved here because the schools were not getting what they needed in our neighboring town. And Reading had the reputation both of the quality of programs and it, in investing in the facilities that could provide those programs. And I think that Reading has, I'm very honored to have joined the school committee in April. I've been learning every day. Thank you very much for everyone that's teaching me everything I'm learning. Um, but I think that one thing I already knew and I continue to learn is the investment in the quality of our schools. It's very well thought out. There's always differences of opinion and the other con constant is that there's always change. Like Mrs. Doctor said, I believe that children's needs in some ways haven't changed because children always needed to learn. They needed social emotional development time. Well, there's more demands in kindergarten now academically, but children still need that social emotional development time. They still need time to play. And I think it's really important to have a full day kindergarten option Notice I'm not saying mandatory, I'm saying option, because children can really benefit from that. I think it's important to support those families that can't necessarily afford it. I think that we all hope that someday this, like some of um, Mr. Downing and um, Mrs. Doctor said, someday this will be free, but right now it can't be, given the funding of the town. I think it's really important for us Someone else used the phrase to bite the bullet. I think that this is a great compromise for the time being until the state comes around and there is funding for full day kindergarten. I think we need to make this available. And I think that it's a good thing for our children and our families to have this choice. Um, 
The other piece that I wanted to say is that community is vital. The culture of our schools being positive is vital. Once you add a lottery and you have the haves and the have-nots, the people that can have the full day kindergarten that they want and those that cannot have it, then we put a division right there in our communities and in our schools. And I don't think that is a healthy thing for us to do. I've said that all along and I still feel firmly that I really hope that people will support this motion so that we don't need to go to a lottery and deny people if they choose full day kindergarten, the opportunity for their children to be in the program. Thank you very much. Further discussion for those who have not yet spoken? Yes. You. Uh, Diana Kane, uh, Precinct um, 6. Um, I'm remembering back, I think my son will be 60 years old today. Now, he went to um, private kindergarten, but there were available <laughs> those modulars when he was in sixth grade. I remember that at the Barrow School. And then and then my grandchildren w went to Barrows, and they were in, they went to private kindergarten, but there but those but those modulars I think were still there. <laughs> but anyway, so I have nothing. The I think the, mo the mo modulars or portables, I think they were wonderful, especially for young children, um, because little kids I think were happier with smaller <laughs> and not being with, you know, uh, the hub of, uh, of uh, um, you know, one through six, uh, through five, or now, one, it used to be one through six. But anyway, um, and I do know, having been a broker in this town for many years, that um, young parents cannot, who have children, or if they want children, you, you, you need to have two parents working to pay the taxes in this town and to, so I understand that, and the price of real estate uh, in, this, you know, in this area is high. Um, and uh, you just absolutely couldn't live, live here uh, if you didn't have two parents working for the average, I would say the average, um, um, homeowner. So I can see it from all sides. However, I, I think young children um, at that age are better with half a day kindergarten myself. Um, however, um, if there's no alternative here, I think uh, it's probably a good, uh, a good solution. Um, however, uh, I don't think they'll be temporary, my friends. I think they'll be here for 50, you know, 15 to 20 years, having looked back through, uh, through uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The next thing is the, um, you know, the space for these. Um, and thinking about Killam, who I think has been shortchanged uh, through the years, and maybe we might think of and they do have space, thinking of possibly uh, certainly making them first in line for uh, a good addition to Killam School um, because I think they've been left out <laughs> of through the years uh, for expansion. Um, so uh, that's my feeling, but I do think that uh, there's nothing wrong with, the, uh, with half a day kindergarten. Further discussion, for those who have not yet spoken? Yes. yes, on the end, on the edge, yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Is this good? Yes. Uh, Cameron C. Slack, um, Precinct 4. I just want to follow up something Mrs. Where are you, Snow Doxer? Mrs. Snow Doxer said, and a few other people, um, 23 years ago, a newly divorced uh, woman moved here from uh, Reading 
from Revere, and it was the best decision of my life because I got to enjoy, pardon me, I'm a little nervous, um, the Reading school system. But unfortunately, I had to go um, to a private school because Reading only offered half-day kindergarten, and um, she was obviously a working mother. Um, and I went to the SEAM school, not sure if that's around anymore, but it moved buildings about halfway through the year. And eventually, when I went to first grade at uh, Joshua Eaton, it was a very rough time not knowing anybody there. I had a very rocky first year. And eventually settled down in second grade, and it turned out pretty okay. But um, uh, eight years later, my brother, similarly, similarly, with a working mother, had to go to a private kindergarten all the way over in North Reading. Very bad commute at rush hour every single day, again, for a working mother, also with an additional child. <laughs> and I just want to say, if I had, and my brother, had the opportunity to go to Joshua Eaton, four blocks from our house, it would have saved our family a lot of stress over the years and possibly a better experience adjusting back into a uh, public school system in the first grade. So I support this in its entirety. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Hi, Kevin Walsh, Precinct 5. Move to question. Moving the question ends debate. I would remind you that there have been non-members who have asked to speak, but that's still this body's right to, to end debate. It requires a two-thirds vote. Uh, Mr. Brown, would you take my right and uh, the Finance Committee? Mr. Crook, would you take the right center? Uh, Mr. Rushworth, would you take my left center? And Ms. Russell, would you take the left and the Board of Selectmen? Again, this is a vote to end debate. All those in favor of ending debate, please rise. Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Mr. Crook? Nineteen. Nineteen. Thirty. Thirty, Mr. Brown? Twenty-nine. All those in opposed, please rise. Thirteen. Nine. Nine. Eleven. Eleven. Thirteen. Thirteen. Yes. Vote being ninety-nine in the affirmative and forty-six in the negative, the motion carries. We will now. We have a point of order. I understand that we, we do have some, at least one uh, non-town meeting member who did want to speak to the issue and uh, it was understood that that opportunity would be made available. And I apologize if I should have raised a point of order prior to the vote to close uh, discussion. I actually made that point. I said that there were people that had asked in, the, in non members to speak, and I, I allowed, the, I told the body that that possibility existed. The body has spoken, though. So, debate has ended. We will now move to a vote on the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 6, Mr. Lalasher. I would ask that you refrain from uh, clapping. This is a uh, legislative body. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I thought they were clapping for me. <laughs> um, Article 6 is where money is spent. So what you've just done is put some items in the capital plan. There are some other issues here. The real importance is the two capital items that you just discussed. Um, we will be asking to spend 1240000 from free cash. As I've said earlier, 40000 will be returned by the end of the year. There are some other, and it's spelled out in the motions handed out more specifically. I've summarized them. 
There's a lots of financial housekeeping in terms of wages and expenses. The only benefit of doing this now is when town meeting sees a budget in April, it'll be apples and apples so you can compare things. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to do this. Um, so it's not any more complicated than that. Income report, Mr. Doxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting of January 21st, 2015, Finance Committee voted to recommend the proposed amendments to the fiscal 15 budget by a vote of 8-0-0. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Any further business under this town meeting? None appearing. Ms. West? Move. Adjourn signy die. We have motion to adjourn signy die. Is there a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. This town meeting stands adjourned. Signy die.